talking today about, yeah, managing Airflow version upgrades. And the goals, I would say, are I'm going to talk about some common, you know, failure modes, you know, ways that things go wrong when we do upgrade. I'll get into some mitigation strategies or, you know, tools that you can consider using in, in terms of trying to make it a smoother process. And then as part of that, we'll try to understand a little bit about just some of the nuances of Airflow versioning and how that trips people up sometimes. And I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to, it's pretty practical, like this, it's just like a lot of different suggestions and stuff. And yeah, uh, so hopefully people will take away at least maybe one thing that, that maybe they didn't think about before. Um, uh, as far as just to introduce myself uh, briefly, I started out uh, doing a lot of, uh, uh, like in an analytics team, doing a lot of SQL and reporting and, and stuff like that, migrated over to data engineering and data warehousing and that kind of stuff. And somehow got away from, you know, using, you know, traditional GUI ETL tools where you have jobs like this. And then, uh, you know, moved to, you know, Airflow where you have like much more power to control, control your data pipelines and build, you know, reusable abstractions and that kind of thing. But... Anyway, so just a few quick caveats before we get into the details. So people, everyone has a, like a di different, or organizations that use Airflow have varying degrees of, of risk tolerance or, you know, varying degrees of, you know, the mission criticality of the jobs that they are orchestrating, right? And so there's not really a one size fits all approach and you're going to have to chart your own course through this, but I'll try to give some suggestions that you can consider employing. So yeah, the failure modes that I am going to talk about are the following, right? Well, number one, you know, your DAGs don't parse, right, after you do an upgrade. Number two, you know, you, maybe they parse just fine, but they fail when you run them. Or you, maybe they don't fail, but they don't do what you thought they were going to do, or they just don't do something right, right? Another one is database migrations, right? So when we commonly, when we upgrade Airflow, there's, we're, making, we're doing a database migration, which is changes to the Airflow Metastore database, right? Sometimes we can run into trouble there and the migration will fail. And then if you get past all of that, sometimes after, sometimes you upgrade successfully, but then you encounter bugs or certain regressions, maybe performance is not what you had before, right? So what do you do in that scenario, right? So the first one we'll talk about is DAGs don't parse, right? This is thankfully the easiest one to deal with, right? You can actually just write a test, you know, to verify that your DAGs parse, right? You could throw this, you know, you know incorporate this into your project, right? It doesn't even necessarily have to be, uh, you know, automated through CI or something, right? Like this is sort of an intro track talk, right? So maybe not people don't have the most sophisticated setups, but it doesn't need to be automated. You can just do it as part of your your pre-upgrade, you know, part of your upgrade day routine, right? Uh, check that your DAGs parse after, you know, upgrading locally, okay? So there's not really a good reason to be caught by this after an upgrade. The next one I'll talk about is, you know, DAGs that fail after, af that, that fail when you run them after you upgrade, right? One thing that I think is useful uh, is to add uh, to your project some, what I call integration test DAGs, right? So the idea here is you want to write DAGs that are going to smoke out issues with uh, the, the connectors and services that are critical to your, uh, your, your real production pipelines, right? And what, what I've done in the past is, you know, create a couple, you know, integration test DAGs, right? There, I, I put integration test in quotes because it's not properly an integration test, right? It's just a DAG that you use to test, the, to test that all your services are working properly, right? And I, you know, stick a, a ta I add a tag to them. Okay, this is an integration test tag, right? I can run them a million times without, you know, necessarily, you know, causing causing problems or spending a bunch of money or something. What would it look like inside of an integration test tag? Here's just an example. Like, suppose I use Microsoft SQL Server at my company, okay? And I and I use S3, right? And I use Snowflake, all right? So I could write something that does something extremely simple. Just, you know, select star from, you know, table schema dot tables or something, you know, dump it to S3, then create a table in Snowflake, load it into Snowflake, and if this DAG is working, then there's a good chance that all my other DAGs, which use SQL Server or, or, or in S3 and Snowflake, that there's a good chance that those are going to work too, right? So I could create a, you know, a dev environment or something like that, run, run my, do the upgrade, run my, run my integration test DAGs, and then if everything works fine, then, me, then I feel much more confident about proceeding with the upgrade. Yeah. 
speaking of making you know new environments, you know that's a good thing to be able to do for a lot of the things in this talk. So you know whether you're using the open source Helm chart or whatever you're using, it's it, you want to be set up so that it's easy for you to create new environments and do that kind of testing. And yes, let us proceed. So we talked a little bit about one scenario. Yeah, DAGs don't parse. Two, DAGs that, that fail when you run them after an upgrade. But let's go into a little detail about some of the nuances of why this tends to happen to us sometimes. And, we, and for that, I want to take a little detour and talk, just talk about Air, Airflow's versioning scheme, and in particular, Semver. So, Semver uh, is short for semantic versioning, right? And semantic versioning it categorizes every release into one of three kinds, right? It's either a patch release, a minor release, or a major release, right? So a patch release just has, has bug fixes in this kind of thing. Not and this kind of thing, it should just have bug fixes. And then a minor release would have new features and potentially some bugs, right? Because when you add new features, there's a good chance you're gonna break something. And then a major release, we're intentionally breaking things, right? We are adding new features that are backward incompatible, right? And so, we might, so we'll have breaking things that are intentional and unintentional, right? But so when you know what Semver means, you know what you're getting in an Airflow release, which is good, right? Except the Airflow Semver story is a little bit more complicated. And the reason for that has to do with when you think about like how Airflow is distributed, right? Oftentimes, I would bet that probably a lot of people are using the official Airflow image, right? The official Airflow Docker image, right? And so, the like we so we package Airflow Core separately from and, and really and we version Airflow Core separately from all of the providers, right? And there's good reasons for that, but the the consequence of that is that when we cut an Airflow uh, official Docker image we're packaging with it all of the providers, whatever the latest state is, right? So you can see that when going from 2.9.0 to the patch release 2.9.1, we get a major release of the Hive provider, right? So if you happen to upgrade to 2.9.1 and you're using the Hive provider, you, you just took on a major release and maybe if you, if, yeah, if you use Hive, you might have broken all your DAGs, right? So that kind of underscores the importance of testing, of doing something like some kind of integration test DAG kind of situation. And then what else to do about that? So it's important to know what providers you are using somehow or another, right? Maybe you document them in requirements file or a constraints file. And then when you know what ones you're using, when you're evaluating, you know, this is the next release I'm going to upgrade to, you can look in the official image and see which providers have changed, right? And then when you see which ones have changed, you can understand what type of change they are because you can look at the versions, right? And you know what Semver means. And then, of course, you wanna look at the release notes because we do a pretty good job, I would say, of telling you, you know, hey, this, is, this major release has you know, these breaking changes. This parameter that we've already deprecated is going to be removed. And so you have some amount of fair warning about this kind of thing. The other thing that I would recommend that people consider doing is using the slim image instead of the, the normal, the non-slim official airflow image. So the slim image, what's special about that is it doesn't install all of the providers, right? It just in, installs a few core providers. And then what that does is that forces you to specify you know, explicitly the providers that you're going to install. The, the cost of that is that you know, you're on your own with regard to managing some dependency conflicts if you're staying with an old provider in a new version of Airflow and therefore you're potentially deviating a bit from what's in the official constraints file that we publish with every major or with every release. But it's probably a worthy trade-off and it seems like it's probably a good idea to use the slim image and have control over that. You're not gonna, if you're using the slim image, you're not gonna be surprised, you're not as likely to be surprised by an accidental, you know, inadvertent upgrade of a provider like in that scenario I highlighted before. So another, on that topic, just one sort of random recommendation is that I would try to be eager about resolving your deprecation warnings, right? These things show up in tasks, it, task logs and in scheduler logs and web server logs, right? 
and it's probably you know pretty it's pretty easy to ignore them but maybe find some way to just create a ticket for your team and have someone address these deprecation warnings early and so you're not dealing with them at upgrade time and so that kind of covers the dags don't parse and dags fail when they run scenarios let's move on to migrations so what is a database migration we're adding, so Airflow, of course, uses a database to track the state of all the tasks and, and DAGs and such. And occasionally we need to make changes to that database, either maybe adding a column or a table or removing an index or something like that. And occasionally these, these operations can be expensive, especially if you have a, you know, an, an, a tenured cluster, you could say, that's been around for a while and has a lot of rows, right? And so what could go wrong? Well. One thing, if you have a, you know, a statement timeout set on your Postgres instance, right? Maybe you'll exceed the statement timeout and your migration job would be killed. There's, I'm sure there's a lot of other things. Probably many of you could share horror stories of things that have gone wrong, I don't know. But what I would just say is that with regard to the database size for your Airflow Metastore, you gotta have a strategy about keeping that under control. And one mechanism that you can use to do that is utilize the airflow db clean command, right, which, you know, if you give it a, a, a table or two, probably, you know, maybe just do one at a time, but I'm just doing showing here you can do two. Uh, per, like trim, it, it, it allows you to trim the old records in your tables. And whether you use this utility or you do it yourself manually, just keep your database size under control. It's good not just for the migration, but also just for the healthy schedule, healthy functioning of your cluster. The scheduler doesn't like it when there's 10 gazillion rows in the task instance table, right? And that's pretty normal. So another thing you can do when you're planning to upgrade is you can look at the SQL that will be applied when you are when you're going to do the upgrade. So there's this there's this little option here with the db upgrade or db migrate command I think is now called where it will just spit out the SQL it's going to run. So you could do this ahead of time so you know what's coming and you can say, okay, this is gonna be an easy migration or oh, this one might be a little bit more expensive. Let me, let me go ahead and make sure I trim my tables that are gonna be affected by this migration. You can also just run, the, you, could op, you, you have the option of applying the migration sort of offline bit by bit with the individual SQL statements. That's a possibility, not necessarily gonna be the right choice for everyone, but it's, a, it's an option for you. The other thing I would say is do dry runs. You know, if you, particularly if you're on the more cautious side of things, you can create a, a, a test environment, run an upgrade, run a downgrade, see if you can do that round trip successfully. You know, if you're really ambitious, my copy, you know, res, do, do that on a restored, you know, a restore from your, you know, database instance to like see what it's actually gonna, how long it's actually gonna take with the actual data that you have. A lot of options, that's why it's kind of, uh, it just depends on your risk tolerance and all of that. And another thing you can consider is using cluster downtime, right? It's, it's possible to, you know, basically turn your cluster off and have nothing running when you do the, the upgrade. This might be for somebody, yeah, there, there might be com companies for whom this would make sense. It's not al always going to be practical because you might have very long running tasks that, so it might not really be practical to have a window where the cluster, cluster's really doing nothing. But if, if it's something you're interested in, you can explore it, you can, you can make your Airflow cluster not schedule anything by setting use job schedule to be false. And you know, not that I would necessarily recommend this for everyone, but you, know, you can even just uninstall Airflow and with, you, know, you can do a Helm uninstall so that there is no Airflow anymore. And the RDS or your Postgres you know, server is just sitting there doing nothing and you could do the upgrade on, on, on that Postgres server and then reinstall it, you know, uh, but that might be a little too radical. So bugs and regressions, the fourth and final topic here. Let's get into it. So we did everything right, right? We tested, we have a unit test to make sure our DAGs parse. We, we did some kind of something like an integration test to make sure that all of our services work properly. We, you know, planned for the migrations and we maybe draw, ran it. But then we upgraded and now things aren't working right for some reason. Maybe there's some weird error we're seeing. Maybe the scheduler performance has really tanked, you know, and we don't know why. Well, you kind of have two paths, right? One is to try and march forward, try and fix the issue somehow. And then the other would be to try and roll back somehow. So let's talk about what I'm calling option one here, not that it's necessarily better. 
try to fix it, right? So what would you do, right? Of course, the first thing is if you do have the luxury of helpful error messages, that might give you the answer right there, and you might be able to come up with a patch that would fix it. And we'll talk about, I'll talk about patches briefly in a second. The other one would be to look at our GitHub. There's a good chance that other people have tried to upgrade before you, and if they did, maybe they found the same issue. Maybe there's some discussion happening around that. So get comfy with GitHub and, and our, our issues, and occasionally on Slack, if, particularly if there's a new release and there's some issues with it, there might be some chatter on Slack. Um, and you know the other solution might end up being to upgrade again, right? So what if you're on a very old version, you're upgrading only to like one or two miners, right? Well, one of the issues with that is the way that we apply fixes, right? We don't always backport them to very old minor releases, right? We tend to only kind of patch the latest minor and we might not backport anything. So you might have to upgrade to something more recent, you know, and yeah. So in terms of how to apply patches, right? I've done things like, you know, taking the, the taking a, a file from our, our, our GitHub, modifying it or something, and then just copying that into Docker. I've done, you know, said, you know, find replace. Those are probably not the best ways to do it. This is a better way if you're gonna, uh, if you're gonna patch something, it's also just easier. You can create a, you know, do a diff, like make a change locally and like you're in the Airflow open source thing, make a diff of it and dump it to a file and then you can apply it in your Docker image. You know, this is, so we're, t we're talking here about, you know, some, sometimes these are kind of extreme measures, right? When you're trying to make something work, you know, for production, right? It's something to have in your toolkit and it might be something that's worth practicing. In terms of, uh, in, in terms of the other option, which is rollbacks, right? You gotta have some kind of rollback strategy and you have to exercise it, most importantly, I would say. What does a, a rollback or a downgrade look like? So y you're probably going to use our, utilize our downgrade command, right? And then, and then do some kind of Helm deploy with the earlier version. If you're using, you know, if you're using Astronomer, we do have a sort of first class rollback feature that that does something like that but there might be times when of course downgrades do not downgrade is not possible for whatever reason or maybe doesn't work and in that case you, you want to be practiced in restoring from the backup that you took before you started the upgrade process and and as well ideally you know you have some sort of disaster recovery kind of capabilities or strategy where you could, let's say, just delete the whole Airflow release or just de destroy the entire Kubernetes cluster and stand it back up. And as long as the Postgres instance is still there, everything's still working and your jobs are running. Because it is possible that your Kubernetes cluster gets borked and you, that's what you need to do. 